There was one post, I guess, that went up this week, uh, last week, um, and it was something about, can you load PowerPoint presentation in the LinkedIn platform like you can do in Zoom meeting? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd like. I wish I could. Do, wish I could do PowerPoint here because I'd love to show you guys some some research and things like that. We got to figure out a way to do that. If anyone knows how to do that, where we can have a big forum like this and we can use. I can use. Um, what do you call it? Um, you know, PowerPoint or anything else that I need to do. Um, and like I like to show research. I love to show research. When I consult with people, I usually show them research because I don't want you to believe anything I say. Now, 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 we have to get down to something. This is really amazing. Some people got very upset from a post I made, and I, I'm not even sure of the post. It was, it, it must have been something, I, I was talking about our natural food, our natural diet being, um, being plants. And somebody else wrote me a letter, kind of a letter, or, um, telling me that I was kind of, that I was uh, a bully and that I was making everyone feel bad because of the way, uh, because, of, because I was telling you what I, what I have found out, what I know um, <clears throat> about eating animals. So I, um, anyway, if I made someone feel bad, I apologize. I don't want anyone to feel bad. That's not my intent. But it's interesting. If you feel bad because of what the way I word things, like, for example, if, if instead of calling it animal flesh meat, if I call it animal flesh or corpse, and it makes you feel bad, then maybe there's something inside of you that is that doesn't quite uh, resonate with eating animal corpse, you know, because, or if you didn't care, if you don't care about it, if you think it's okay, then, um, then it shouldn't make you feel bad, no matter how I say it. So anyway, I don't, but I don't really mean to make anyone feel bad. I'm just telling you the way I look at it. And, and I think it's realistic to call it a corpse and not, and not to call it a beef or a pork chop or a nugget. Just call it what it is. You know, in other languages, they do. Like in, in Thai, it's nua. Nua means uh, flesh. and It means muscle, but it also means meat. So they kind of call it what it is. So we can do that. We can do that. We can call it that. Anyway, I don't mean to be a bully. That's not what I intend to do at all. I just trying to... Uh... So I explained to that person. I responded back to that person, and I explained that I'm... That, uh, you know, you don't have to be a vegan to be healthy. If the waterways were clean and the oceans were clean, which they're not, okay, the oceans are, um, as I said before, it's probably safer to eat out of your out of your toilet than to eat out of the oceans. They're so dirty right now. Um, and then most of the waterways, you know, rivers used to be clear. Now they're brown. But anyway, if, if you could find somehow a fish and um, it, it probably would be okay. And um, and eggs, I would never say dairy, but um, uh, anyway. So and you could probably be really really healthy. And I've met people that, you know, <clears throat> Japanese who eat a little bit of fish and uh, lots of vegetables, and they live a very long time and they're they're pretty healthy. But 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 that's not our optimal. Our optimal is 950 years about. That's where we can live to. And that was the Adam and Eve diet. You're all familiar with that story, right? Genesis 129. It's pretty clear on what we should eat. But anyway, um, um, let me get back to where I was, what I was trying to say. Um, anyway, I don't make, I don't mean to make people feel bad, but, uh, so for me, not eating is more of an ethical situation. Uh, of course, eating even eating animals is, you know, when we look at the studies, all cause uh, all cause mortality in vegetarians versus non. You know, it's clear, it's clear. Even Seventh Day Adventists who are eating, you know, 
pasta and pizza and bread and things like that. And they still have less uh, cardiac, less uh, uh, nervous system, you know, strokes, less cancer. Yeah. But, but anyway, you can still be, you can still lead a nice, healthy life and be, uh, and eating maybe some eggs and some fish. However, for me, it's an ethical thing. And uh, the way I look at it is <clears throat> if I don't have to, if what I'm going to eat did not arrive at my plate through some form of violence, I'm happier. I feel better. I can, I feel like I can eat it with, with a, with a, with a peaceful heart. You know, if something had to be murdered and I know, and I, and I know, I know that animals just don't volunteer for this project, this project of feeding our tongues. So anyway, I don't know what to say to you guys. And then, and then one other, and then a few of you said, they, you didn't like my analogy of a rabbit and an apple with a playpen because you, someone said, well, you know, a baby can't eat an apple anyway. I know, I know, but he would lick it or she would lick it and smell it. And then somebody else said, yeah, but babies put anything in their mouth. They put rocks in their mouth. They put, okay, okay. So anyway, the point was, it's not our natural instinct to try and eat an animal, and it's not our natural instinct to eat a corpse. It's not. And I think eating corpses is what brought about the, uh, the black art of cooking, right? So um, anyway, and remember, you don't, use, you don't really like, I only know one person who eats raw, raw chicken. So I'm saying what I wanted to say is that you guys don't really like flesh. You like the way it's prepared and the sauces and the flavorings and the spices, right? So it's not really the flesh you like. It's not like it's not like you would like to grab a, a dead cow and eat it. So anyway, let's not keep talking about that stuff. Um, yeah, I don't mean to be a bully, so thank you. Yeah. Anyway, there's that. And then the other thing was the person was talking about oxalates. And I'm going to do a store. I'm going to do I'm going to redo a visit to oxalates. OK, and I may. Um, I'm not going to be uh, in harmony and resonating with uh, David Wolf and some of the other people now that are saying, oh, these are no longer superfoods. Kale is not a superfood. Broccoli is not a superfood. These are bad foods. They've got oxalates. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to address that subject in detail with tons of research just to show you that that's absolutely not true. And even if I didn't look at the research, I want to tell you something. Our clinic here in Arizona has been around 18 years. Before that, I was in New York about five, five years doing the same kind of thing. Um, but anyway, we serve Celery, cucumber, kale, spinach, oxalates, lemon, and apple. Bad. And uh, my staff been drinking it at least a quart a day, five days a week for 15 years, 18 years, however long they've been there. People that go on our juice cleanses do it for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. I did it for uh, while working for about a month. I should have gone longer, but I had to travel, so I couldn't do it any longer. But it feels fantastic. And we've never had oxalate stones. We've never had calcium oxalate stones. And oxalosis, oxalosis is really a condition that arises from um, basically a genetic defect. You're born with a genetic defect, and you produce your body produces too much oxalates. It's not from dietary sources. And it's usually found, this gets usually diagnosed early in life as a PD uh, when you're a child. So anyway, I won't get into all of that. But um, anyway, no matter how you do it, uh, are you MD or DO? I'm an M Emma Salah Heaton. I am an MD, medical doctor. Do you have dogs? I have cats. I have three incredible cats. I've had dogs all my life, all my life, all my life. Anyway, so let's get into it, you guys. Let's ask you, let's answer your questions. Um, 
There's the question. Yay. Okay. So what can be done for, this is uh, from the, an Instagram question. This is what can be done for intrauterine growth retardation in second trimester? Blow, blood flows are good. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, you said your blood flows, are, the blood flows are good. So I'm assuming you mean in the, um, you know, placental blood flows and all that. So uh, this is not, not one of our usual topics, but it's a, it's a, it was somebody needs the answer. So, um, as you know, intrauterine growth retardation, you know, there's two basic causes, right? It's either fetal, the fetus, or it's the uh, um, uh, maternal. There's some sort of problem. And the maternal is m very often due to placenta. And there's all kinds of placental problems, you know. You have low-lying placentas, right? They're right near the Oz, right? Right near the cervix, like within 20 millimeters, or they completely cover it which is, um, uh, uh, they, they have a different name for that, <clears throat> placenta previa. And then there's a placenta accretia where it gets in beds really hard and stuff. There's all kinds of problems. Um, and uh, you can get a situation where the blood accumulates underneath it and all that sort of thing. And that can result in IUGR, which is uh, um, intrauterine growth retardation. Um, so anyway, the mother, so, you, so what can be done for this? The, the, the mother, um, uh, you know, some of the situations that go on with the mother is if the mother has, um, you know, high blood pressure or has some other chronic condition, um, that that contributes a lot. And of course, if the mother's taking in any toxins at all in their, into her body, that's going to affect it a lot. And uh, so, you, you know, so what the mother needs to do is get as healthy as possible, uh, keep the colon clean, get to sleep as, as, as early as possible, like eight o'clock, um, drink t at least a liter or two of green, really healthy, delicious, fresh juice a day and eat really, really healthy, eat a wide variety of plants, eat tons of seeds and nuts and chia porridge and things like that and just get get yourself as healthy as possible clean out um you can't not eat you can't go on a fast when you're pregnant of course but you can drink lots of juices and flood yourself remember a juice cleanse is, is the reason we call it a juice feast and not a juice fast is because you're getting all the nutrients all the mac you, you, there's three macronutrients fats carbs and amino acids right so you're only not getting the fats but you're getting the carbs and the amino acids you're also getting all of the phytonutrients all the vitamins and all the and all the chelated minerals that come up so you're getting everything in vast amounts much more than you would get from just eating because you couldn't eat that many vegetables so drinking that and eating this just get super healthy uh, that's all you can do now i don't know you said blood flows are good i don't know if you've had vaginal bleeding or anything like that but um uh you know, and then the other final thing it can be is uh, something genetic going on. Um, and uh, so anyway, I'm sure you know all this, so I don't think I helped you too much. But anyway, that was what I wanted to tell you because um, so let's see what our next question is. How come I keep losing it? There it is. My gosh. Okay. There we go. Next question. What do you recommend to put on routers in the home that limit EMS? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a interesting situation because <clears throat> why do we want to limit EMF, EMF in the first place? You all know why, right? Okay, electromagnetic frequencies. They're different than, so let's talk about electromagnetic frequencies. Um, there are some that are like the, the ultraviolet, the visible light, microwave, infrared, um, radio, and the extremely low frequency. These are all non-ionizing. In other words, they don't have enough energy to knock electrons out of molecules, out of atoms, and cause damage. So ionizing radiation does. And ionizing radiation is... Uh, you know what you get if you're going to get radio radiotherapy radiation therapy for cancer right that it's it's that's what they do <clears throat> they use uh, ionizing radiation that's the kind of radiation you get also when you go get near um, you go to chernobyl or you go to fukushima okay 
Well, EMFs are not that, so they're not knocking things out, but they do do something else. They paralyze the voltage-gated calcium channels on our cells, and calcium needs to go back and forth in, in our cells all the time. It's essential for functioning. So when these the, the, the electromagnetic frequencies paralyze these, uh, e uh, these voltage-gated calcium channels, and calcium just pours in like a million molecules of, of cations per second, all right? That's, pretty, that's how quick they go, a, a million per second. Now, when they go in, they stimulate the production of nitric oxide, and then they mix with the nitric oxide, and they produce peroxynitrates, nitrites, you've heard of them, perhaps, and then uh, they turn into what are called hydroxyl radicals. Now, the hydroxyl radical is probably the most damaging of all the radicals that we get into our bodies, into biological systems, okay? The hydroxyl radical is OH negative, and... Uh, in fact, it accumulates all day in our bodies. It's always, it, it just accumulates. It's one of the biological, biochemical intermediates involved that gets involved in when we're making energy in the mitochondria, all right? Um, it also is just, it just it's, it, it's, it's constantly being produced. Um, and when it does, <clears throat> um, uh, it causes damage because it will grab anything next to it and destroy it. Okay, this is so for that reason, God gave us uh, the ability and the uh, requirement of producing 10 liters per day of molecular hydrogen. We've talked about that before. So molecular hydrogen, which is H2, will pe will penetrate. Hey, Barry. Wow. So what do you got? Um, um, anyway, where was I? Uh, oh yeah, the molecular hydrogen penetrates all cells, all cells. It's the smallest molecule in the world, in the universe. Penetrates it, and when that H2 gets that OH negative, it turns into H2O, which is water. So it's beautiful. It's a specific antioxidant. So our body makes 10 liters of that at, at, at night, uh, a day, a day, 10 liters a day, right? Now, the other thing that our body does, um, under the auspices of the divine is um, um, at nighttime when the lights go out, we produce melatonin. Our pineal glands produce melatonin. And um, melatonin, each melatonin molecule will grab four hydroxyl radicals. So the melatonin establishes the sleep cycle, the circadian rhythm, gets you going to sleep. And then it... Um, becomes the night janitor and goes up and cleans up all these metabolic wastes and um, stimulates T cells and natural killer cells, et cetera. So it's just magical stuff. But anyway, so that's what happens with EMF. And this is the way our, we're naturally able to take care of it. So uh, anyway, if you're, if you're exposed to EMF, one of the things you might want to do is get molecular hydrogen anyway. And you can get a molecular hydrogen machine or you can get, which will make it out of water or you can uh, get the, like the tablets, Mercola has one that I use because it's very easy. You just drop three tablets in the in a big glass of water in the morning, drink it, and then maybe in the afternoon again, it's, it lasts uh, about three or four hours. And especially if you have a job that, that where you're sitting next to a computer or you're, you're getting exposed to EMF, do it. But anyway, so what are they using? They're using router guards. And um, the problem with router guards is that if they work, if they work, the better that a, a router guard is like a cage they put around a, a router. And that is um, basically a Faraday cage. And a Faraday cage is, uh, they use it in electronics, like when they, when they have to keep a, an electronic system like uh, free from any uh, exposure or influence by anything else, they put it in a Faraday cage, right? I mean, if you put your phone in a Faraday cage, it wouldn't work. You wouldn't, it wouldn't pick up signals and it wouldn't sense signals so the problem with the with the with, with the router guard is that it if it's really really perfectly great and blocks everything your, your your router won't work you know and then some people are saying some companies say well yeah we block the emf but we you still have normal service well that's impossible because the service is requires uh, uh, the emf so it's that's not true 
But what usually happens if you put a guard around it is that when you walk away, I mean, the further you get, you, you, like before, uh, before maybe you could, you could have access to your Wi-Fi, I don't know, way back in the other room, and now you won't be able to or something, you know. So it decreases the, uh, the radius, okay? And, um, you know, so that, that's the problem with these, with these things. Um, so um, my advice for the EMF is that when you, you use it, when you have to use it, try to keep your, all that use in one room of the house. If you have multiple rooms, keep it in one room of the house and turn it off when you're not using it just to unplug it turn it off don't don't just turn it off now if you live in an apartment building if you live in a condom condominium you're in trouble because you can't i mean even if you turn yours off you've got the, you're getting exposed to other people so what what would you'd have to really do if you lived in a condo or lived in an apartment um thank you cheryl um is actually people do this they make a faraday bed and a cage at least so you can go to sleep without getting bombarded you can actually make it now faraday cage or faraday equipment and they're making faraday clothing right now it's just uh, uh conducting wire like copper or something else and um silver uh, threads right and they're they're going in one direction and they just that, that blocks the emf So anyway, that's that's that. So it's really, I mean, it's really hard. I my, so my advice is, use the use the you, if you want to have good reception and get your job done and get around, you can't use too much. You can put a small cage on it. It's going to decrease it, but it's not going to stop it because if you actually stopped the uh, the, the EMF from you know coming out of the uh, out of the router, then it, the router wouldn't be receiving any either, and so it wouldn't work. So it's just kind of one of those things that if we make a choice to 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 use these devices that require electromagnetic frequencies, we're going to be exposed to some degree. So we have to protect ourselves by using the, um, um, you know, by taking extra melatonin at night and uh, molecular hydrogen. And as soon as you're done, unplug it. You don't need it on when you don't need it on. All right. What would be a good treatment in combination with methylene blue for cancer? Well, a uh, good treatment in combination would be uh, ultraviolet blood irradiation. I mean, methylene blue, uh, as you know, is a uh, uh, can be activated by light, by red light at 680 nanometers, 650 nanometers around there in the red light, the far infrared and the near near red um, will activate the methylene blue. So, you know, a lot of times we can paint it on a lesion, a tumor and, and expose that to the light and the light will then, uh, then, then will get activated and produce a, a, a lot of free radicals and, and destroy the tumor. That's what will happen. But it also turns out, see, the, the mechanism of action of, well, you know, first of all, methylene blue was um, uh, synthesized by a chemist in, in the 1870s, a German chemist. Um, and um, for, to, uh, to use as a dye for clothing and things like that. And it was soon, soon discovered that you could uh, use it for staining cells when you're looking at cells. So, so, uh, the scientists, the when they were using the microscope, would, could the biologists they could stain the cell and they could actually see the the organelles inside of it and they were able to see that they, could, they also found they could uh, see uh, you know parasites and they could see other uh, microorganisms much better. So it became a, like it's normal part of a laboratory now. Any kind of microbiological laboratory all has they all have methylene blue right now. So. Uh, it's methyl thioninium chloride is what it is, but it's a synthesized thing. It's not a natural occurring, right? And then, um, but anyway, what it does, what, what the, one of the, the thing that it does so incredibly um, is it is 
remember we talked about redox biochemistry as being how life exists on a biologic from a biological level right the difference between a rock and a frog you know pretty much might have sim very similar um, um, uh, molecules uh, but what's the difference well the the frog is able to extract from its environment nutrients in the form of gas such as oxygen and uh, a glucose which is in a plant or something and together produce ATP which is energy and electrons and it's able to produce these electrons and the electrons are exchanged by molecules that give them off and molecules that accept them it's kind of like a relay race the, the givers and the takers and they work together and that's how we have electrical currents in our body and that's how we're alive and when those electrical currents do, uh, stop and we have a flat line on our ekg our eeg or muscle it's dead that organ is dead and if it's your brain and it's dead or your heart you know so anyway so it's this yeah, Ethernet's yeah, yeah. Ethernet's a good thing, you guys. Um, uh, anyway, <clears throat> um, so that's redox biochemistry. It's the exchange of of them. And and one one of the reasons that ascorbate or vitamin C is so important is because it's an electron donor. So it gives don it gives electrons. Um, but anyway, so what methylene blue is is it it's able to do that exchange with with electrons. So if you Recall, we always talk about the mitochondria as being central in the uh, initiation and progression of this chronically fermenting process that's known, uh, you know, the Rockefeller word is cancer, but let's try not to use that. So I don't know if we have any new people on, so I don't want to do it. Is uh, do it. Uh, talk, uh, I want to make sure they understand so everybody understand cancer and even even if we're going to use the word cancer let's turn it around and call it recnac recnac sounds a lot better there's no emotional punch with it it's a much better word recnac or chronically fermenting cells um but anyway so uh the chronically the 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 the, the process of this developing of this problem developing of this um, adaptive response developing is when a certain percentage of the mitochondria are destroyed uh, or, be, or rendered dysfunctional. So when that happens, uh, the cell has to go into a default mode of energy production called glycolysis or fermentation. So anyway, inside of the of the mitochondria, there are like four systems, protein systems, cytochrome systems that um, um, are are involved in this electron, taking the electrons. Remember, oxygen comes in and glucose comes in to the mitochondria. And oxygen is held together. Two oxygen atoms are held together by these really incredible uh, uh, electrons. The same with glucose. It's got it got electrons in there. Anyway, together they just produce a lot of produce a lot of electrons. So the mitochondria are a mechanism of taking out these electrons and saving them and putting them onto ATP so that the person can use them later when they need them for all of their enzymes, etc. So um, anyway, it turns out methylene blue can do that. So if one of those proteins, cytochrome systems is knocked out, is, is for some reason not working, the methylene blue will take over. So this is what happens. They use it in emergency rooms. You know, if you're poisoned, if you get cyanide poisoning, right? Cyanide poisoning, you know, knocks out those, uh, those, uh, those, those electron transfer systems inside of the mitochondria. And if you take methylene blue, it's going to correct it and, and save your life. So it's really, really important in that. It's also, they're finding that it works with Alzheimer's. It works with Parkinson's. It works with depression. Uh, it, it like gets rid of depression more than this, the whole idea with serotonin, you know, because right now, um, and, and a lot of you may have been prescribed serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs like Prozac and all the uh, Lexapro, I mean, whatever, whatever their names are, I don't even... I don't pay attention because I don't use them. I don't give them to any. I would never prescribe them to anybody. I would want someone to, uh, if, if we think that there's a serotonin problem, then let's let's correct your gut microbiome so that you can produce more um, uh, serotonin, right? 
So anyway, methylene blue is amazing in that area. But the main thing that it's doing is uh, allowing the exchange of electrons. It's restoring mitochondrial function. And that's the problem with when we have chronically fermenting cells. So it's a big deal. But it also, just like ascorbate, vitamin C, which is an antioxidant because it donates electrons to, um, to quench uh, or to neutralize free radicals, well, if the ascorbate donate, and when ascorbate adobe, uh, donates an electron to um, iron or copper in their three plus state, remember copper and iron both have a three plus and a two plus state. The two plus state is the active form. The three plus state is not quite, okay? So when it gives, it gives an electron to a three plus, it becomes a two plus, and that produces hydrogen peroxide and all sorts of other free radicals. So the, yeah, yeah, every, yeah. So uh, the can't, uh, <clears throat> the, um, uh, I was just reading SSRIs. I was on them once upon a time. Yeah. I, so that's a tragic thing because most doctors, when they don't um, have an answer for a person who's come to them for help, when they don't have an answer, they do two, one, one of two things are their most favorite. You guys might be able to understand this and relate to this. What are the two favorite things that allopaths, MDs, love to do when they don't know what to do? Steroids. They give you steroids. It's going to shrink. It's going to make you feel better for a while. You're going to you know, get giddy and all that stuff for a while. And then you're going to get really sick. But that's what they do because it, it, it works in that it, to, to, to make you not... You, you know, it, it helps with pain and swelling and all that sort of thing. And and the other thing they do is they go, well, listen, it's all in your head because if it, you know, I, my blood tests show that there's nothing wrong with you, so it's all in your head. So you need some um, antidepressants. And that, that's it. So antidepressants and steroids are the the biggies. You know, um, yeah. So so uh, you know, the other thing about methylene blue, which is really interesting, is that if you have a fish tank and you put a couple drops in. It prevents the, any fungus from overgrowing. You can use it with your pets so that they, if they have any fungal infections or uh, they like on their skin and stuff like that. Um, methylene blue is is amazing, but it it, it eliminates a, a nasty microscopic colonization of different parts of the body that you don't want. Um, yeah, yeah, steroids are bad news. They're bad news. They work in the very short term to decrease symptoms, but they have nothing to do with the underlying cause. And these are what doctors do. This is what allopaths do. And of course, if they don't know what's going on, then it probably is not worth knowing about because they would have learned it in school because they went to one of the best medical schools in the world. So if they hadn't heard about it, then it probably doesn't matter. And it's all in your head and blah, 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 right? And you can eat anything you want and you can, yeah. You know, the methylene blue does other things too. You know, it, it, it inhibits a nitric oxide. It, it inhibits um, 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 it's called guan, guan, guanolate synthase, uh, which is really important um, for, uh, so you don't have too much cyclic GMP. And uh, the reason that's important is because when someone has a chronically fermenting condition, the cyclic AMP and the cyclic GMP ratio is reversed. So the more GMP you have, the, the more you're likely to be having the chronically fermenting conditions. But the guanolate cyclase, which is um, slowed down with methylene blue, which is pretty cool, pretty cool, increases um, the NAD to NADH ratio. In other words, you get more NAD, NAD plus, right? NAD plus, right? A lot of people... A lot of uh, functional doctors are giving NAD plus, right? Um, and then you can also take oral precursors that increase your likelihood to make NA, to make your own NAD. But as you get older, you make less and less NAD. And again, NAD plus and NADH, that ratio is very important. It's the um, the uh, uh, reduced form, uh, the, the oxidized form versus the reduced form. And um, NADP, NADPH, NADP plus and NADPH right? Those ratios, all those ratios determine your redox status. And that's essential to understand uh, the, your, your condition of health. So that could be done. So the question here is why, uh, 
what could be done for Parkinson's? Well, again, uh, methylene blue is amazing, and you can do it intravenously, up to like two milligrams per kilo. Um, uh, but uh, and that sometimes they even go higher. For Parkinson's, also intravenous glutathione is amazing. Um, you can watch someone with Parkinson's who's got who's pretty much advanced, like just turn around and like become normal on intravenous glutathione and all that, because basically what's it's thought that Parkinson's, um, the, the fundamental eat, um, defect, the thing that's going on is that the cells, and there's a part of the brain called the substantia nigra, where part, um, those cells stop, lose the ability to produce glutathione, so, so they can't detoxify. And so that's what happens. So if you can give them glutathione, and then uh, there's many things you can do with Parkinson's. Um, but anyway, so, and methylene blue, anti-malarial. Uh, gets rid of depression. It's just pretty magical stuff. Uh, and you can take a few drops every day, a couple times a day. It's really good. It's going to help clear you up. It helps with cognition, memory, just like it helps people with Alzheimer's. It helps with uh, cognition and memory. But it's very important for photodynamic therapy. And if you can get up to the red range after you've, you've given the... Uh, um, so especially on a tumor that is either, you know, breast or, 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 or skin or something you can you can expose to the light. Um, now there's a Dr. Weber, you may know that you may have heard of a Weber device where he used intravenous laser therapy and he would put in the red and the different, the different kinds of um, wavelengths of light. And he, you know, was, you know, his, his, what he's saying he's doing is he's sending that light uh, all throughout the body so that you can get into deeper structures. You can, you can activate, the methylene blue from deeper structure in, in deeper structures and it's not always methylene blue there might be other pigments that can be used right in photodynamic therapy yeah so pretty amazing amazing stuff um and uh what you know one of the there, there was some work done with uh the combination of alpha lipoic acid and methylene blue okay so think about it now alpha lipoic acid enhances pyruvate going into the mitochondria, meaning instead of the cell going towards fermentation, right, these chronically fermenting cells, it kind of stops them from doing that and pushes the pyruvate into the mitochondria. So now it's got to go through the old fashioned way because because these chronically fermenting cells, um, cancer cells, all, also have um, mitochondria. They just prefer not to use them and, and they don't have as many and they're shrunken and all that. Other but they still have them. So it's forcing, it forces them up. So if you're doing that with alpha lipoic acid, and then you're using the methylene blue to get in there, and so that once the pyruvate gets in there and you, and, uh, you know, you for, it forms into acetyl-CoA and then, you know, goes down the, the pathway, the Krebs cycle and produces all this energy now, but it's doing that in the mitochondria. So the methylene blue goes in there too and helps it, just keeps it moving. So the combination of the alpha lipoic acid and the methylene blue are amazing. The synergy is amazing uh, and very helpful for anybody with any kind of uh, chronically fermenting condition. The other thing I would recommend for that at the same time, it, it kind of um, in a, um, is uh, uh, dichloroacetate, DCA. You've all heard of DCA. It's a very small molecule. It's used for children uh, who were born with, um, uh, you know, they have a defect at, at that area in the pyruvate dehydrogenase. Um, and they, uh, they are always in a state of acidosis, lactic acidosis. They wake up in the morning and they feel like they just ran a marathon. You know, they're just aching all over like that, right? Anyway, the DCA blocks that because it, it again, it, it blocks the same thing. It blocks the pyruvate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase kinase. And therefore, it sends it sends the, uh, the the pathway, the energy pathway, back into the mitochondria. So if you're using DCA and you're using alpha lipoic acid and methylene blue, wow! And then imagine this: now, if you have a, um, if you can do um, either a Coley's toxin or you can do uh, whole body systemic hyperthermia, where you actually stimulate mitochondrial proliferation, right? Uh, the other thing is there's two peptides. So, so we're talking about mitochondria. How do we how do we restore mitochondrial function since that is 
the main fundamental thing that that gets impaired that results in a chronically fermenting condition how do we restore that well we restore it with dca alpha lipoic acid um, methylene blue and uh, hyperthermia getting your body so hot that it produces heat shock proteins which stimulate mitochondrial proliferation okay so now you've got more mitochondria you do all this stuff and then of course you've got to be eating really healthy right if you're eating healthy then you're going to have the right fats and everything because right at remember we have to produce a fat called cardiolipin and cardiolipin sits right at the if you look inside the mitochondria they have these folds like that right and right up in the like like here's the fold i mean here's the outpocking outpocketing and then in there is the fold right up there at the at the at the center part of that fold is a uh, fatty acid called car cardiolipin and cardiolipin is fundamental to getting the whole thing oxidative phosphorylation the energy production inside the mitochondria right and so what happens is as you age or get sick that that or if you're not eating human food that cardiolipin starts to get oxidized and as it gets oxidized the mitochondria that that part opens up and then it becomes way less efficient at uh, producing energy and you, uh, you get really hard making energy right chronic fatigue a any illness is going to be um is always associated with fatigue but anyway so there is a peptide called uh, ss31 um and you can do that and i and, I, and that's also very good ss31 is going to is going to tighten that back up so you can get efficient working of your mitochondria and then there's other there's one other uh peptide that's very helpful in this mitochondrial this quest to make the mitochondria restored and that is um um mot c okay m-o-t-s-c all right it's another one and what that does actually is um it stimulates the mitochondria to produce a protein that goes in, uh to the um to the um to the nucleus and then the nucleus comes back and turns on the antioxidant uh systems within the mitochondria so it protects the mitochondria so it's a way of protecting mitochondria it's uh it's just amazing so if we could do all these things and we and we've got to do the, the the peptides continuously right the methylene blue you can be sipping and i mean drinking it on a daily basis and then when you get therapies with it you'll get you'll get the dca iv you'll get the uh, ala you could have taken orally every day and uh then you can get it iv dca iv the, the ala iv and then the methylene blue iv and and, and then go into hyperthermia or do that yeah then go into hyperthermia because hyperthermia is a six-hour process so if you're doing it right and i don't know any places doing it right except people who learned from dr kobayashi so anyway that's what that's that methylene blue yay 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 uh <clears throat> How do you suggest I handle my polythemia, polycythemia, polycythemia vera? All right. So um, anyway, polycythemia vera is uh, it, it's in it's 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 a condition that's grouped in what they call myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS, and myelodysplastic Milo refers to the bone marrow certainly especially a certain part of the bone marrow and dysplastic means it's not it's you know it's kind of it's not working right it's slowed down it's sluggish it's scarring down it's not not responding right it's almost like you're getting uh yeah the changing in the there's a change in the cells it's just not working right right so now what's in the bone marrow and this is in the bone marrow so what's in the bone marrow you got the red blood cells you got the white blood cells the progenitors of the red blood cells the white blood cells and the platelets and so anyway so myelodysplastic syndromes have been always known to be what they used to call them pre-leukemic because they they could turn into leukemia so um but you know the polycythema vera is uh, the problem is 
that they get uh, increases in all, all three lines or decreases in all three lines, right? And if you get the increases, like too much red, too many red blood cells, you know, you can get strokes, you can get heart attacks. It, it can be really terrible. So one of the treatments they do is bloodletting, just um, they call it phlebotomy. You just go in and get some blood taken out. Um, and so that's, that's how they handle it. Um, um, but, you know, with, with the polycythema of area, only about two to four percent can actually become um, can turn into any kind of leukemia so it's very low very low chance of it happening but what do you have to do what i recommend for this sort of thing is um uh, hyperbaric oxygen hyperbaric oxygen is it, it just incredible um in in this situation okay so you go in the hyperbaric and you've got to get those machine you've got you can't go into the um um, you will, you can't go into the, uh, I think, uh, you know, those hyperbaric units that are kind of made of, uh, like, uh, you know, that, I don't know what you call it, canvas material, like the same kind of material that they make tents with. So they have them like that, but those can only go up to like 1.3 atmospheres, not really strong enough, um, uh, to allow for higher pressures. And uh, with any kind of situation like this, you want at least 2.2 atmospheres. So with 2.2 atmospheres, um, and you go in there like five, six times a week for an hour, that's fantastic. Do that, okay? Um, we want to get oxygen in there. Also, if you've got you've got this uh, situation called polycythemia vera, uh, uh, you want to just be uh, get as healthy as you can. You want to detoxify your body, clean your colon. You want to move around. You just want to be healthy. Remember, in all of these conditions, and we can put names on them. Right? We have names, right? We call this polycythemia vera. We call this uh, leukemia. We call this uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. We call this uh, adenocarcinoma of the uh, ovary, adenocarcinoma of the colon, adenocarcinoma the prostate, whatever we're going to call it, it's all the same thing. It's basically biologically the same thing going on. And what we need to do is remove, get rid of all toxins, all waste products and all that. And as we age, I mean, I'm talking from by the time you get into, by the time you end your teenage years, you're into your 20s, already you've slowed down in your ability to eliminate toxins, okay? Um and, uh, you know, f unfortunately, nowadays, uh, young children are already toxic. We're seeing incredible amounts of obesity and really sickness because they're getting injected with these things, with these uh, with these chemicals, these these uh, evil, evil chemicals. Right. They're getting injected with it as at young age. I mean, from the you know, it's just crazy. They get that and then you feed them non food. You feed these kids food, what they call food, but it comes from a package. And remember, if it's food, you don't need a packet. You don't need a label, right? You don't need a label. Why would you need a label? Do you need a label for a banana? You need a label for a tomato? You don't need a label. If you need a label, then there's something hidden, right? <clears throat> uh Children married, yeah, there's a question coming in here, but yeah, not not married anymore. It was, it's been a while since I've uh, been married, but uh, children are grown and uh, uh, my son eats pretty good. And that's about it, but uh, he eats really good, you know, it's really good. So uh, he's never eaten a corpse. So that's kind of cool. Um, Anyway, uh, so, you know, these poor kids, so look at them. We're seeing eight years old, nine years old with diabetes type 2. What? What? Diabetes type 2 in a, in a, in a child? Well, that's because we've, we're, they're, they're being destroyed. Can you imagine being, being born and then you immediately start getting injections and then, and then whatever the, is in the formulas and stuff like that? And then even if you're having your mother's breast milk, I don't know how many how many chemicals have been found in, in, in mother's breast milk. How many? 250, 300, you know, of, of these really seriously damaging chemicals in breast milk. So because we're living in a, you know, 
there's an all-out war. If you guys don't know it, there's an all-out war against, uh, against uh, well, I just have to say against humans. Yeah. There's a war against humans, and the uh, goal is to get us down to 500, about 500 million genetically modified cyborgs. Um, as you know, cyborgs can interface with uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, and that's kind of the goal. And it's been going on for quite a while. It's in our food and everything like that. So anyway. Anyway, everybody, you know what? It's time to wake up and stand up and scream this. Let this know. It's, you know, no longer, no longer can we sit back and be silent about this. Because what is at stake is the human race. Not nothing less than that. The human race is at stake. I know a lot of you get really angry when I talk about these things, but how do you not talk about it? Suppose I get really healthy and then the and then they come along and do their thing. It didn't matter. All right. So it's part of being alive. It's part of being healthy is to avoid just like to, you know, you don't go walking out in the middle of a freeway, right? You don't go walking out in the freeway. You're not going to walk out in the freeway because you don't want to get slammed and killed. Well, the same thing's happening here on all levels. So you got to watch out what you're eating and everything, and what you're breathing. I mean, gosh, you know, where I live, there's no chemtrails. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, just going, go, going back to, you know, the other thing is, uh, is everyone is the, um, you know, the maitake and shiitake, but maitake is really, really good. Um, you know, um, and especially with uh, with people who have like, if you have a low white count because of, of chemotherapy or because of radiotherapy, if you have a low white count and all that, you can increase the monocytes, you can increase neutrophils with maitake. Um, yeah, so you know, the, the medicinal mushrooms are very important, uh, really, really important. There's a lot of research, a ton of research coming. That the Japanese have been researching this for a long time. You know, Agaricus blazii, really Im uh, important uh, turkey tail. You know, you all know about these things, maitake, shiitake. Um, so they're all very, very important for stimulating the immune cells, or stimulating the white blood cells, et cetera. Um, and the other one is vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 does the same kind of thing. And especially with myelodysplastic syndrome, it's very, very helpful, okay? And myelodysplastic is a crazy kind of thing. So you really have to um, do something. You really have to um, actively be healthy. And remember something. It's, I don't know why it's a secret. But it is for some reason. It's a big secret. And the, the secret is this, that health can only be obtained through by via healthy living i mean there's not another way you cannot negotiate it you cannot coerce it you cannot buy it health is something you earn from living a healthy life it's 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 um it's something you earn it's the consequence of living healthy period so all of us, because we all have smoldering degenerative conditions happening inside of us because we're alive on the planet with gravity uh, and we're exposed to all sorts of stuff and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So living healthy. You all know what that is. That means going to bed early. That means moving around all day and all that. Yeah. Yeah, LDN, agreed. LDN, low-dose naltrexone. Start with 3 milligrams. You go up to 4.5 milligrams before sleep. We, I got to do a whole thing on, on, on low-dose naltrexone. Very, very important. The only person, people that can't take it is people who are taking, uh, who are unfortunately taking um, uh, narcotics for pain, you know, like opiates for pain. They're going to be in trouble because... If they take the low dose naltrexone, it'll reverse their pain medicine. Uh, they'll be in pain suddenly. So, uh, yeah. 
multiple myeloma strategies to stay in remission. Um, yeah. Um, well, again, multiple myeloma, again, is another of the same. It's, 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 it's this chronically fermenting cells that are in a, uh, have to do with the bone marrow, which is because, you know, multiple myeloma is the, the production of the B, you know, the B cells and they produce plasma cells. The plasma cells produce these, um, uh, M proteins and things like that. So, you know, that's multiple myeloma. One of the ways of keeping that from happening, and I don't know if you all can try to find a doctor, um, and it's probably going to have to be a, 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 a holistic or integrative doctor who has uh, what they call double filtration plasmapheresis. Um, and if you do that, if you got multiple myeloma or anything like that, uh, or even any any type of any type of chronically fermenting condition, whether it's breast, pancreas, and all that, and no matter what you're doing, it's just not working. Well, if you were to do a blood test called serum protein electrophoresis, you would see that your alpha one um, spike is really high and then your albumin is low and on and up well that if that's high that means it's got immunosuppressive proteins in there so what you do is you go through and you do the plasmapheresis and basically your blood goes through these two filters double filtration plasmapheresis and comes back into you and cleans out all those uh, immunosuppressive agents uh proteins it's just incredible and uh so uh, you know we're getting one here in the U.S., and I'm going to have I'm going to have them at my uh, centers in, uh, in in Thailand, of course. And uh, you know, once a week, while we're doing whatever we're doing, let's do that as well. Let's keep out these immunosuppressive proteins that that, that get there. But it's really really good for myeloma. Like if you did that, you could just yeah, you'll be cool. So that's it. That, do that. But the other thing with that with multiple myeloma is like anything else, you got to live really healthy. Intra intravenous vitamin C, amazing for multiple myeloma. Intravenous vitamin C. And take your, remember, sip seven to seven. Everybody knows that. You sip seven to seven. Uh, thoughts on annual dermatology checkups? I mean, no, I, I no, no. You know, what, what they, it's not sun exposure, but it's health, the way you live. I mean, if you're eating really terribly, you know, you're eating non-food, greasy non-food with pesticides and herbicides and fungicides in there. By the way, you know, if it's not organic, uh, it's got pesticides, herbicides, fungicides in it, right? And insecticides, and which happens to a rhyme with suicide, genocide, infanticide. Right. So uh, the, when, when the question comes up, should I eat organic or organic so expensive? Yeah, but the but what, what is not now? Well, I know. I know they might say it's organic and it's still got some chemicals in it. True. But you have more of a chance of there not being poisons in something labeled certified organic than if it's not labeled and if it's not labeled, they just whatever is in there. Yeah, but I know they're changing the, you know, and now there's this new, what is it called? Elite, um, elite, Aline. I don't know. It's a new Bill Gates uh, uh, bomb to the world. He's sealing the food, the vegetables with some sort of substance. I can't remember what it's called, but it sticks to the food. It can't be scrubbed off. And he, of course, is, I mean, how? I can't talk about it. I won't. Appeal. There you go. Appeal. What the heck? Appeal. Yeah, it's appealing to him and Klaus Schwab. They're very, they find it very appealing to put this on the food of other people. And you notice that King George, if you notice about him, King George, when he travels, he brings a whole entourage and brings his own organic food that they grew far away from us, the proletariat, right? The proletariat and the, the serfs and the slaves, you know, nah, nah. So these guys aren't eating what that we're eating. Believe me, and they've got us addicted to not me, but they've got most of a lot of us addicted to these non foods, right? You got to understand. Anyway, uh, I don't think you need a dermatology uh, 
checkup. One thing that you can all do if you get a lesion that you think is like, for you know, there's squamous cell carcinomas, basal cell carcinomas, and then there's melanomas. Those are the main three uh, fermenting situations that happen with skin. You can get uh, ozonated olive oil. You can you apply that. You can get uh, five or ten percent Lugol's liquid Lugol's and paint it daily, a couple times a day. Uh, you can also get hydrogen peroxide. You can get the. Um, uh, you got to try to get up to about. 9, 10, 12%, right? So you can get you can get the, uh, what do you call it? The um, food grade, 35% food grade hydrogen peroxide. And then if you take equal parts of water and hydrogen, now, now you cut it in half, right? So now it's 17.5, right? Um, percent, uh, um, percent hydrogen peroxide. And then you cut that in half, do it one more time, that's 8.75%, 8.25%, I think. What is it, 8.375, whatever it is. Um, and uh, that's a good one. And then you paint a lesion, wherever that lesion is, several times a day with that, it'll kind of burn it off and get rid of it. So you don't have to uh, do a lot. Or if you have an o if you have if you have access to an ozone, you can bag that arm or it's hard to, you know. Of course, if you've got a lesion here, you can't bag your head with ozone. So what's the next question? Green tea heavily contaminated with fluoride. Do we still drink it? Well, yeah, we do. We still drink green tea because when you when you want to make a list of things that you should of supplement supplements you should use and uh, to preserve your health, green tea is like on every list. It's got it's just amazing. It's antioxidant potential, anti-inflammatory potential, anti-cancer potential. It's got it's just it's just fantastic. And and neurologically, you know, it's got theanine, so it kind of tones down our um, our excitatory uh, uh, stress it kind of mellows it out. So it just does many, many, many things. It's so important. Um, but anyway, so the idea with green tea, see green tea, um, like, you know, like um, all teas, uh, you know, come from the same, um, same plant. It's just one plant. And whether or not it's green, black, or white teas just depends on what happened to the to the leaves, you know, how did they, what did they do? How much were they oxidized? So with the black tea, what they do is they take the black, they take the green leaves and they dry them out completely. So they get completely oxidized and they turn black and then they, they roast them or whatever they do. And you come up with the black tea, the green tea, they skip that part. They don't dry them out. They don't let them get oxidized. They just take the green leaves and they go straight to, um, um, steaming them. Right, they can see them. Some people bake some places that make it will bake it, and some people even fry it. But I certainly wouldn't do that. But the steaming is how you get. So when you get green tea like sencha, um, that's what it should be made of, right? And then the white tea is the least oxidized of them all. Now, um, so in terms of fluoride, yeah, it's a bio. You know, this plant, the clinorsis, is a sinensis, is a um, is a bioaccumulator. So it'll pick up stuff that's in the soil. So it really, it depends on how it's grown, right? And how organic, truly organic, when we say organic, in this, we're talking about non-pesticides, right? Um, non-pesticides, uh, fungicides and all of that. Uh, and also using soil with good, with, with lots of minerals and having worms and having uh, uh, lots of healthy bacteria in there. You need a really good, healthy soil. And if you're doing that, you won't have any fluoride. But there was an interesting study where they uh, they looked at and they 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 obeyed all the rules uh, of tea brewing. Like for example, if you talk to um, you know a, a, uh, anybody from you know Japan or China or Korea, um, they about brewing tea. It's uh, and in fact in Japan, you know they have a um, they have a tea ceremony. It's like almost a religious type of, of ceremony. It's, it's they take it very seriously. Um, but anyway, when you pour tea and they treat it, you know, one thing about Japanese, they have an extreme reverence and treat um, tea, rice, and uh, soy. They don't mess with it. 
I mean, in terms of GMO and stuff like that. <clears throat> but anyway, um, so the the fluoride. Um, actually, there are other other nasty minerals that could come up in the soil too. But anyway, there was a really neat study where they took uh, and they looked at uh, they took Chinese green tea, Japanese green tea, Korean green tea, and green tea from Sri Lanka. And I think they took like 2.5 grams of it and they heated it up. Now, the people that, the, you know, that know about green tea uh, is that you only heat it up to 71 degrees centigrade, which is about 160 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't go all the way up to boiling because if you do that, you'll lose the sweet fragrance of the green tea and, you, and the flowery, delicious flavor, and it becomes more bitter. And you also extract more stuff out of it. Um, so they don't do that, and they do it for the usual steep steeping time for green tea is, so at 160 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling. So you gotta get one of those things that allows you to measure the temperature in your, in your water. Um, and you know the, 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 the steeping is like anywhere from I think about one to three minutes. So the average they took, they did two in this study. They did two minutes. Um, so they steeped it for two minutes and then they measured the, fl uh, the fluoride content. And they used only organic. And the reason they used only organic teas is because the, and they used the leaves, the, the leaves, and they steeped them. They put them in a steeper, right? Like this, you know, the thing like that. It's got a mesh, a mesh ba basket. The reason they did is because synthetic, uh, Pesticides uh, have fluoride. So they had to make, you know, so to, to avoid that, they did the organic. So they got organic Chinese, organic Japanese, organic uh, uh, Korean, organic um, Sri Lankan green tea. Um, and they did that, you know, at 71 degrees centigrade, 160 Fahrenheit for two minutes. And then they measured the, the, uh, the amount of fluoride. As it turns out, it's related to the amount of fluoride that's in the groundwater of these countries, right? Um, and so, um, you know, that'll tell you that if you want to grow it organic, maybe you can do it in a in a greenhouse, and where you control the control the soil and you use the you know water that's fresh and uh, clean. Uh, but anyway, they found that the uh, the the most fluoride was um, Chinese, number two, the Korean, number three, the Sri Lankan, and number four, Japanese. And the numbers were, um, you know, pretty, you know, pretty significant. The, um, the, the uh, China had 6.83 parts per million. The, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, Koreans had five something, five point something per million. Sri Lankans had three or something, and the Japanese had 1.8. So very low, very low. And that would they, they were all organic from those countries, okay? And so they were trying to figure out why. You know, maybe the water was fluoridated that they watered it with or what. They, they don't know exactly why that happened. But they looked at the groundwater of these different countries, and it was in the same order. You know the most fluoride in, in in China, China in soil in China, then South Korea and then um, uh, Sri Lanka and then Japan. So anyway, that's what we should do. And remember something that the uh, the fluoride. You know, there is no physiological requirement for fluoride. It's not like chloride. We need chloride. We need iodide, but we don't need fluoride. There's no thing. There's no physiology for it. There's no chem. There's nothing that's required to maintain life or anything like that. It's not required for cells. So, um, so the the great the great lie came out about uh, well you can form ca uh, calcium fluoride. Ca you know ca it, it'll mix with the cal calcium and form and, and make it more rigid and so it's good for your dental health. Turns out to be absolutely false. It's the opposite. In fact, in, in communities where they have fluoridation, they have increased bone fractures and increased osteoporosis, brittle bones. 
Uh, and the same with the, the teeth. And then if you have too much, they call it fluorosis, dental fluorosis, and, and then basic fluorosis is of the bones. That's when you're getting too much. So like a 70 kilogram male, uh, a male or a female, 70 kilogram human being uh, would die if they got acute exposure to 10 grams. And then lesser amounts cause diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and stuff like that. That's in an acute, an, an acute exposure. But the continual slow exposure, we know that as the cal as fluoride combines with calcium, and it and it goes right into the pineal gland, and that's a bummer, okay? Because the pineal gland is where we make what melatonin. It's where we make ayahuasca or uh, dimethyltryptamine, and it's where we make um, um, epithalon. Now, epithalon, I'm not sure you're familiar with that. Epithalamin, which is a peptide that basically, uh, if you get that, you can you can purchase that. You know, uh, probably the only place in the states you can purchase it without having to go to some doctor and pay him extra money for it is to just go to peptidesciences.com and um, you can order any kind of almost almost any kind of peptide. You want but uh, the epithalon actually increases uh, uh increases uh telomere length by a third so that's pretty cool that's pretty cool like to keep those telomeres long right telomeres um the, more, the shorter they get the less you know then you get to the point where you can't uh, the cell can't uh, reproduce anymore so anyway um but the uh so the pineal gland produces the melatonin, which is really important. Right? Why? Because we know that blind people have less cancer, less uh, chronically fermenting conditions than people who can see. We know that, right? So, um, and we know that the pineal gland will, will can uh, uh, accumulate a lot of uh, fluoride. Now, the reason is, is the pineal gland is a very special gland because it has to do with our circadian rhythm, which is really important because our circadian rhythm is kind of a uh, an objective way of looking at understanding our relationship with our mother, the earth. Okay. And um, so what's very interesting about the pineal gland is that the pineal gland has it's second only to the kidneys in terms of blood flow. It's got all this blood flowing through it. You know, the kidneys have a lot of blood flow because they're filtering it, and then you know, and you produce urine as a result. So you've got a lot. You've got much more blood flow through there than you do through the liver. Uh, the liver is getting it some, some other way, and you know, all that. You know, so and the heart. Remember the heart. We're talking about blood flow through the organ, through the actual parenchyma or the actual um, functional units of an organ. Because because uh, you'd have to say, well, the heart has the most because but it's not going into the heart muscle. It's just the heart is doing its action. Right. So um, but actually the pineal gland is number two to the kidneys. Uh, so it gets all this blood flow. Which is really important. It's like four mill four milliliters per minute. Per gram. Of. Um, of uh, weight of the of the pineal gland now the other thing that's interesting is you all may have heard of the blood brain barrier the blood brain barrier is a kind of a, a complex tissue that does not allow does not permit everything that's in your blood to go through into the brain into the cranium right because it's got to be protected so the blood brain barrier is very important so a lot of things don't get through into the brain um, it's protected but the pineal gland is outside of the blood brain barrier so it's 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 getting everything and remember that's going to help and that's why it can, can accumulate fluoride so it can accumulate fluoride and fluoride what, what they have found the studies have found is that as the floor more floor there's there's a relationship between the amount of fluoride it has and the amount of melatonin that also means the amount of epithalon epithalon epithalamin controls the the whole uh biochemistry of the uh, of the pineal gland including the melatonin production and all that sort of thing so it's really important and then the um dimethyltryptamine is also very important 
uh, for certain experiences in life, such as transcendental experiences, aha moments, um, love, you know, the feeling of love, you know. Um, so, and we have uh, receptors in our brain for them. So very important, very important. So the pineal gland is very important. And it's all, it's thought that that, that, that uh, dimethyltryptamine, they call it the spirit molecule as well, and um, is, um, you know, released, released a lot at the time of our death. And um, it has, to, it's kind of like the bio, the biochemical correlate or the biochemical mechanism by which um, uh, the, you know, to, to, to account for the experience that someone goes through. Same thing happens in people that have near-death experience, experiences. They, they, they produce a lot of um, uh, dimethyltryptamine. So dimethyltryptamine, by the way, is the molecule of, um, that's uh, used in, uh, from the ayahuasca ceremonies when they take the two plants and, you know, and uh, anyway, so very uh very important to keep the bread because you know the dimethyltryptamine is kind of the biological biochemical mechanism by which we have transcendental experiences so who knows how it's working with our mind and our spirit and all that sort of thing it's called the spirit molecule but you don't want to you know it's and that was originally you know that's what they think was the uh, the, the third eye referred to the pineal gland um, and you don't want that eye closed. You want to keep that eye wide open. Yeah. So let's see. What's the next question? Uh, is it dangerous if vitamin D is in your body is too high? I mean, I don't know what you mean too high. 90 to 120 is good. I've several times found my, the check my, it was up to 300. No big deal. I had somebody who checked theirs and it was like 800, 900 and they were okay. So I'm not saying you should have those levels. I'm just saying that you don't, don't, don't worry about it. Um, but you want to keep it anywhere around a hundred. I think a hundred is a good number to, to keep it at. You can go to 120 easily. Okay. So, uh, I, um, I read somewhere that you can get gallstones from fasting. Is there any truth to that? Well, Here's the thing, gallstones and kidney stones, all the, any kind of, is, is precipitation. And precipitation occurs due to pH and to uh, volume of water, okay? And you can easily understand that if you pour salt or sugar into uh, a glass of water, it'll completely dissolve if you're doing it slowly, but it'll get to a point where you've saturated it and now it will start to accumulate. The salt or sugar will start to accumulate on the bottom of the glass because you've reached the saturation point. So what do you do? You either take out some salt or sugar or you add more water and it'll go back into solution. Same kind of thing with these stones, um, whether that's or that. So if someone would get a, a, a gallstone from fasting, it's because they're not drinking enough water. And that's probably the biggest problem with fasting on water is people don't drink a lot because water gets pretty boring after two weeks. So you got to shake it up a little bit, you know, Perrier, you know. If cancer starts seven years before signs, can can you stop and reverse it, not even knowing you had it? All right. Well, I think that's referring to uh, I, mu I must have said something about um, you, you know usually it's eight to ten years if you have cancer or you have this chronically fermenting condition. It probably, I mean, it began either somewhere around eight to 10 years ago. Now you have to understand how, what we call cancers, uh, how they, uh, how they grow. So you need about 1 billion cells. So to be big enough to be palpable so that you can touch it or, uh, discoverable, right. To light up on PET scan and all that sort of thing. You need about 1 billion. So the way it works is it's called doubling time. So you get one cell, you know, one cell becomes, uh, becomes a fermenter. Now it divides, you got two, two divide, you got four, four divide, divide, you got eight, and then you go to 16, 32, right? Okay. 
the doubling time is what you want to know about. Now, there was um, a um, an interesting study <clears throat> that um, basically, um, when I say 1 billion, that means 1 gram. Okay, it's about one gram. And that's what Kobayashi said. He called when he did his testing, his tumor marker combination assay, uh, his TMCA5 was one gram or more. And that means clinical cancer, clinical chronically fermenting cells, right? Um, so, but the thing is that different, it turns out that different tissues have different doubling times. And you can understand that because, you know, for example, your skin, you have new skin every six weeks, all new skin every every six weeks. You have a new liver every six months. You have new lining to your digestive tract every three days. You have new um, retina, new uh, rods and cones uh, every uh, 48 hours. So the body has got different doubling times, right? So when they looked at cancers, different uh, locations, remember, there's no type of cancer. He's got this type. He's got, she's got that type. There's no type. There's only location. They want you to think there's types. They want you to think that it's genetic. They want you to think that it's extremely complicated and that your stage, you want to use stage and uh, the grade and the stage, all that stuff is absolute nonsense and useless information because the staging system, as I've explained before, is ridiculous. Okay, are we talking about macroscopic or microscopic staging? Huh? What are we talking about? Okay, so stage one is is still in the it's still in the original place that it formed, and it hasn't disturbed any of the architecture of the organ. Stage two is it's getting a little bigger and it's deforming some of the architecture of that organ, whether it's breast, prostate, pancreas, brain, whatever. Stage three, it went into the lymphatic. Stage four, it went into another organ. Well, as I've told you before, a breast tumor that peeks its head through the through the skin is now stage four because the skin's another organ, right? And that's very different than someone who's got, um, you know, brain, lung, adrenal, liver, you know, so that's very different. You can't call them the same at all. And they're not the same. But what I'm saying is that if you have eight, if you have uh, a little small nodule somewhere uh, that is discoverable finally, then it's been there at least eight, 10 years in most cases okay so now so we talked about the doubling time right so you got one cell and then it becomes two okay so um there was a i want to refer to this chart over here um what they found was they did they did all the uh, 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 it's called a um, meta-analysis they looked at several different many different studies and then they kind of got the the data from all from all of them they summarized the data so from pancreatic um, the doubling time was five, a little over five months. Every five months it doubled. Okay. Melanoma about 3.7, uh, primary hepatocellular carcinoma, which is liver cancer, 3.1, kidney cancer, 2.67, triple negative breast, 2.3. Every 2.3 months, it doubles. Non-small cell lung, 2.4 months. Every 2.4 months, it doubles. HR positive, you know, hormone receptor positive breast, 4.3. HER2 positive, 4.1. Gastric, 3.8. Glioblastomas, 2.5. Prostate, 4.1. Yeah, so I mean, these are these are on the average. So that's the number of months it takes to double. So you can imagine, think about it. You got one cell, and it's got to reach a billion, and it's doubling at at this, at, you know, every four months, right? So that's the way it works. That's what I meant by that. I'm not sure. What was the question again? What was the question? Seven years of repetitiveness. Anyway, I'm confused on how the seven-year thing works and what it means. Oh, okay. So you understand now, hopefully. 
if cancer starts seven years before well no the, the, the point is is that's what's happening and yes mo, mo, you know most most i mean most people well, it's not even most anymore half the people that don't get clinically diagnosed with this put it have a spell put on them um uh that's what happens it never gets to the point where it can form uh, uh, one gram or more and if it can doesn't get to the point where it can form one gram or more it's not a, a, a tumor what should i do about a suspect suspect mole well i'm not sure what you have i would have to look at it to give you a really good answer but i would say you should um uh you can use like i said ozonated olive, olive oil you can you can paint on uh, the um um what do you call it you can paint on the uh lugol solution you can paint on um a hydrogen peroxide you can do that you can ozonate it you can, you can do that and, and not biopsy it because if you're going to biopsy it and it's uh, it is, uh, it has become a chronically fermenting. So you're just going to spread it around. So don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. Now, let's go to here's a good question. Postmenopausal for 15 years, is it still okay and beneficial to use estriol cream? Yes, because what you don't, you know, the longer you've been away, the longer you've been in hormone, um, deficiency, which is what menopause and andropause I, that I was heir to. But the, what happens is the longer you're in andropause and in menopause, the more your body is going to um, uh, become less and less efficient at cleansing itself. Uh, you're going to get osteoporosis. You're going to get, uh, you're going to oxidize much quicker. You're, you know, it's just, it's, it, if you want to keep your aging so that it's not so dramatic. Like I'm not ready to be as old as I really am. My chronology. I'm not ready to feel that way. You know, I it, it's like it feel, I feel like it snuck up on me, even though, you know, I've been here for a few decades now. But um, I feel like it snuck up on me, and I'm not ready to be an old man. So I'm going to use biologically identical hormones and uh, all the things that I need to do to to to, to maintain my youth youthfulness, my vigor, my vitality as long as possible. That's what it's all about. So yeah, so estriol is good. And the reason estriol for women is uh, because it's the uh, beta agonist. So it doesn't increase tumor, in, in t tumor growth in, in any kind of tumor. Okay, so let me go over to this was uh, again, okay, so do you start with a long term fasting first or juice cleansing first? Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. Uh, when someone comes in, this was a question on regarding 95% of people who see us at an Oasis of Healing uh, embark on a green juice cleanse. Well, yeah, a, a cleanse. <clears throat> the problem with water fasting at the center is that if you do a water fast, then you can't get any IVs except for uh, flu normal saline fluids. But you can't do, you know, high dose of vitamin C. You can't do all these things. You could probably do some ozone, um, but that would be it. That'd be the only thing you could really do. You can't do anything else heavily. You couldn't do intravenous curcumin. You couldn't do any of that. You certainly couldn't do IPT or anything like that. Um, so it would be for a cleansing. If you just wanted to come in for a cleansing, then you could do a water fast, colon hydrotherapy, lymphatic therapy, exercise with oxygen therapy, um, hyperbaric um, you know, all, not, not, uh, you know, um, infrared sauna for a while, not for too long, not for too many uh, weeks because you won't be able to, you, it'll wipe you out. Um, but anyway, so that, so that's why we do a green juice cleanse and they just drink a lot of green juice, three, four, five liters. Is there anywhere in Thailand that you would recommend for healing? Yeah, hang on and it'll be ready. We're hoping to open in November, December. I don't know. It's hard to say, but... We're hoping to open it like that. Right now, I don't know of any places. Um, uh, 
that's not to say that there aren't, but I just don't know of any that are really. Um, serious and have had the have had the reason have somebody there there's doing research and you know that's just i just don't see that i don't see that i see a lot of uh you know fashion spas you know and and it's fashionable okay so i'm hoping you could address this in the next live i'm currently dealing with mets on the lymph nodes in my lungs and coughing is not fun is there a way to drain lung fluid when it's on the inside of the lung any other recommendations? Chemo seems to have irritated my lungs more. Well, yeah, I don't know your situation. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know your situation at all. But there's no fluid on the inside of the lung. If it's if there's fluid on the in, like in other words, the uh, any body part that's moving, like your joints, they have we have you know joint fluid, synovial fluid, right? You know, we have it here. Any joint that moves, there's a fluid in there, right? And on your knee and all that, you know. And um, so with lungs and heart, the heart is in a sac, and there is a part of the sac that, that grips the heart, and then there's another one around it. And in between is one little thin layer of fluid, kind of a slimy fluid, so they, the heart can beat and move like that without any causing any friction and, and, and problems. The same with our lung. We have a we have a, we have the um, thoracic pleura, which is on the chest wall, and then we have the, uh, the lung pleura, which is on top of the lung, and then in between them is a little bit of fluid. So when you get fluid in the lungs, it's between those two layers, and it builds up. And it's called a pleural effusion. Very different than getting fluid inside. And you don't get fluid inside the lung because the lung inside the lung, the functional unit is called alveoli. There are these little teeny 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 sacs. And when they get filled with something, it's called pneumonia. It's called pneumonia. So you don't get fluid in there. So I'm not sure what happened. But if you're coughing, it probably sounds like a pleural effusion because that'll make you cough and make it, uh, uh, you know, hard to breathe, shortness of breath. That's what it'll do. Uh, and so anyway, for any other recommendations? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of things to do. But I think we should talk, you know, because your, your situation is... Uh, unknown to me. I don't know your situation, so I don't know how to. I don't know how to respond. I, I mean, I don't know. So I've I've got to know you more before I can give advice, specific advice to your situation. What do we tell a guy that has to take a hit before he goes to bed? I know it's a band aid, but all this is easier said than done. I'm not sure what that's in re reference to. Take a hit? You mean on of weed, right? That's fine. I mean. That's fine if that's what you're talking about, a weed when you take a hit. Yeah, I mean, that's fine, and that'll help you sleep. It shouldn't distur disturb anything. You should still get some good quality sleep from that, so I wouldn't be disturbed. I think that's what you mean. What does it mean if I normally wake up at 2 or 4 almost every night? Well, we don't know what that means. Because, oh, yeah, I'm not sure what that means because I don't know what time you go to bed. If you're going to bed at... Eh, seven then there's almost time to wake up but if you're going to bed at 11 p.m or 10 p.m then that's not a lot but what i can say is pe people that wake up and can't go back to sleep uh very often it's uh cortisol's being um produced now the way cortisol normally uh the normal cycles of cortisol are early in the morning we get a peak around 7 8 a.m and then it goes down and we get a, it goes hits the bottom right about 4 5 6 p.m right and then right around 12 30 1 o'clock a.m it starts to go up and that's kind of the cortisol cycle but it just starts to go up but if you started earlier and so by 2 a.m you're like get your, your cortisol's up you're going to be awake so that may be it. I don't know. But remember, cortisol is part of all that is part of the circadian rhythm. So your circadian rhythm may be off. Most likely is. And I don't know if you were in the past uh, going to bed late. And then, yeah. So you got to, you know, we, we, we should have a course on sleeping. I should develop a course on sleeping. Um, 
that's very important. But I think it's it might, it might be cortisol. So what I would recommend for this is make sure you're doing a lot of activity during the day. So you, you have some real fatigue. Make sure you're taking a lot of it, melatonin. And what I would also do is if you're waking up at 2 a.m., um, you keep some sublingual melatonin around. That's what I do, you know. And uh, you can, you know, usually you can get that from Source Natural. I like that one. I like that brand. Uh, and you know, you put it's five milligram tablets. You put them under your tongue. So you wake up at two. You go to the bathroom and you find out you can't go back to sleep. Put two or three or, or four underneath your tongue. Fine, it's fine. And you'll go to sleep soon. Yeah. You know? um, make sure the room is a little bit cool. Make sure your you know, you're not hot and sweating. Uh, make sure you're comfortable, all those things. Sleep is very, very important. You're right. It's very, very important. So what happens when you don't sleep, not just one night, but not sleeping many, many, many nights in a row? Whoa. If you, well, it, you're, not, you're not sleeping at all. You can't go too long without sleeping. You can't. Remember, there's two kinds of sleep. There's restorative sleep and there is a dream sleep. Restorative sleep is where our body is restoring the cells because of the wear and tear they've had all day long. And they need to be restored. And that has and, and uh, uh, that only happens like during uh, deep, deeper levels of sleep, including delta, uh, brainwave sleep. Um, and so the early part of the evening from around as soon as you go to sleep, you should go to sleep at 8 o'clock. And if you go to sleep at 8, you're going to have three good 90-minute cycles before your biological set point is go uh, is turned on and your new biological day begins. That's usually around 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 12.30 a.m., around there. Your biological new day begins at that point. Okay? So... And that's when you're going to produce your cortisol. You're going to produce all these things. And if you want all those cells and organs and glands to be working properly and to work optimally, then you, you they needed to they need they need to have been restored. And they can only be restored as if they had a few cycles of restorative sleep, because before that set point, that 90 minute cycle, about 80 percent is restorative sleep and 20 percent is dream sleep. After that set point at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., um, the it's the opposite. The majority is um, dream sleep and a little bit of restorative. So you go to bed at 11 and wake up at 7. You still had eight hours, but you 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 um, you, had, you had eight hours and you had lots of dreaming. So you're not angry at the world, but you're haven't restored everything. And if you don't dream two, three days in a row, which you, you, a lot of people say, well, I never dream. Well, that's not, it's just that you don't realize you never dream. I mean, you never, you don't realize that you do dream because you're not waking up during a dream, right? If you don't wake up during a dream, you won't know it, that you dreamt. You won't remember it. But the way you know and I know that you dream is because you're not strangling everybody you see. Okay, because if you don't dream, you just you can't you're just crazy angry uh, and you have no tolerance for anything. Right. So uh, anyway. Um, so you say you don't sleep at all. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure what your name is there. It's hard to see. But. Not just one night, but not sleeping many, 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 many nights in a row. You gotta tell me about that. Yeah, I'd be really interested for you to get in touch with me or write more about it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So why am I waking up at 4 a.m.? Well, it depends on what time you're going to sleep. And as I said, it could be cortisol. It could be that your your whole clock is off. Yeah, no, the nit the nitrites nitrates from beet juice are not at all the same as deli meats. No, 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 no. Um, not at all. So the question is, are the nitrates from beet juice as harmful as metabolically as that? So, um, you know, beets are, you know, pretty amazing. If you, it, you know, beets and spinach, you know, because uh, we're talking about the, the, the nutrient, the, the nutrients in there. Um, you know, beets like 14 percent 
uh, of, of the nutrients in there are protein, 83% like of carbs and about 3% of fats, right? And uh, I always like to compare it to spinach because spinach is like 40% protein, uh, almost 50% um, carbs and fat 10%. So spinach is pretty cool in that regard. But um, yeah, and um, they're both high in dietary fiber, you know, and you know, beets and, and dietary fiber and potassium. Um, but, you know, spinach has like 15 times less sugar than the beets. Uh, anyway, spinach has got more B vitamins and things like that than beets. But beets are, uh, you know, you know they, they have vitamin A, they have vitamin E, they have vitamin K, they have all these things. And beets do have all the, uh, all the uh, mineral, uh, B vitamins, uh, calcium, potassium, flavonoids. You know, there's flavonoids, right? You know, it's, uh, the, the beets only have luteolin and quercetin. You know, they don't really have all the other ones that spinach would have, but beets have that. So beets are a really good food, and I wouldn't worry about the uh, the nitrates. They're not a big. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about. It. Certainly not the same as deli meats. I mean, deli meats are. Are, are, I mean, even the conventional people, even the people that like to eat corpses, even they uh, agree. And all the studies show that the deli meats are extremely dangerous because of that. Um, the same with eating uh, what they call red meat. I think it's all red. It's all red because if you were to pick up a chicken and, and, and rip it open with your knife, you'd find that there's it's all red meat. Um, but anyway, so so but but what but, but anyway, so they say that the red meats are more uh, dangerous, and I think that's related to um, actually the uh, iron from the hemoglobin, uh, because as we all know, uh, iron is very um, can be very dangerous. It's very it causes oxidation, uh, it could cause free radical production, and all that sort of thing. So. Uh, the brand, okay, the brand of melatonin is called uh, Wait, what was it? I, I, I'm only, I'm trying to think of seven things at once, so please forgive me. Um, it's called Source Natural. Source Natural. It's great. It's great. Let me show you. I'm in a hotel here, so that was my bed right over there. But anyway, can you see this? Source natural. Source natural. Hard to see with the lighting. And anyway, cool. Little like this. Little under your tongue. Good stuff. So anyway, so so yeah. You see, know, when you think about plants, the amount of nutrition in plants is mind boggling, you know, flavonoids, uh, proteins, fiber, uh, all the macronutrients, all the micronutrients, it's just crazy and the fiber. So it's just amazing. Your thoughts on taking PARP, PARP inhibitors after surgery has confirmed no evidence of active yeah so uh I, I no need no need there's many things you need to do after surgery and you've gotten rid of all the uh, uh, uh you know you got all you know whether it was lumpectomy you got clean margins or whatever you got you but there's nothing left nothing can be identified if you did a scan it would be clean yeah you don't do that what you do at this point now is you detoxify you cleanse you do all those really important things you get the vitamin C going, you know, you sip seven to seven, eight to 10 grams, right? And uh, you get intravenous vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C. And if you're drink, if you're taking it so that you've, you've met all your physiological requirements, right? You're doing that. Uh, you know, so if you're, you know, if you're doing that um, and you're taking high dose vitamin C, and you get those, so like maybe twice a week, three times a week. It's unbelievable. That's so much more important. Plus, you should be taking vitamin A and D 
and vitamin, you know, and uh, you'll get also K, K2. Um, take these vitamins and, I mean, iodine. There's there's certain there's a lot of things you can be doing. We can go into it and take. A, uh, I would also, if you had surgery, do use you right away. Get on pectisol, pectisol, which is modified citrus pectin, because that's going to prevent uh, decrease galactin three, because galactin three travels down the blood vessels and allows any cells that might have come loose during the surgery, it allows the galactin-3, allows them to stick to the wall of the blood vessel or stick to the wall of the lymph vessel and go in and, you know, potentially set up camp there. So uh, anyway, um, the pectisol will decrease that, modified citrus pectin. Yes, here, I, I have you, uh, Rhonda, have you, is saying, have you studied any of Dr. Hammer's stuff in New German Medicine? I find it very powerful to unravel the conflicts. However, most people struggle with fear. They fail to trust the body's amazing ability to heal. Yeah, I mean, New German medicine, Dr. Hammer is incredible stuff. Very amazing and very, very important. Um, and not everybody has access to this kind of thing, Rhonda. So that the, the problem is that not everybody has access to that or can go to find a practitioner that can help them with it. So what I like to always remind people is that we have the ability to get out of the drama, get out of our perception of any kind of conflict that didn't get resolved. We can get out of that by turning our minds off, right? By turning our minds off. Um, and you do that through meditation, which is just learning to shut up. How do we shut up? Because as you all know, it's very, very difficult to shut up. It's very, very, it's almost impossible, right? We've, like if someone said to you, okay, I'll give you $50 million if you stop thinking for one minute. Can't do it. Can't do it. 30 seconds, can't do it. Because thinking is not a voluntary process. It's a happening. Okay? Thinking is an, is, is an involuntary process. And um, because no one decides to think. You know, thinking happens just like your heart beats, just like your glands are secreting, um, all that. So your thinking happens. You know, and, 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 and the problem is we don't know 90% of it. It's subconscious. And we know that there's a lot of negativity in there. And we know that our immune system is, uh, is, is following the mind, right? Because sadness and fear and anger and envy and regret, all those things suppress the immune system. So basically our mind, as long as we're thinking, we, it's like we have our foot on the brake. And we're like, our immune system is just down. It's being subdued. It's being subdued by thinking because 80% of human thinking is negative. And we don't know it. We don't know it. 90% of our thoughts are, are, are subconscious. They're not, a, they're not there. So thinking is, you know, and, and as, and as you know, the, the only place you ever suffer is in your mind. So anyway, if you want to take the brakes off of your immune system, you stop thinking, turn it off. And meditation does that. And you can do that. There are many people that go and get, um, learn transcendental meditation where you can get, you can get a mantra. There's other, other places where you can get a mantra. A mantra is a sound. It's just a sound. It's a vibratory sound that actually is more than just the sound. Because remember, what is sound? What is the universe? The universe is frequencies. Okay. So sound frequencies are more fundamental than even electromagnetic frequencies. They're more fundamental, right? And uh, anyway, that's why, uh, you know, the fundamental vibration of, of frequency is, uh, is OM. OM. It's very fundamental. And if you get, it's interesting, you get like 10 people, 20 people in a room doing OM within three seconds, 10 seconds, they're all on, they're all in harmony. Om. It's pretty amazing. But anyway, what that does is just to slow down the mind and to get the mind onto that. So those mantras are just, they're, they're not actually um, just sounds because they're, they're from the Sanskrit language. They're actually, 
if I can use the word play, places, they're vibratory states of being. And they're very, very, you know, it takes away all that nonsense. Because when I used to practice psychology, when I was a psychologist before I went to medical school, um, uh, you know, I, I realized that you're not going to fix the mind because the mind by itself, in and of itself, the mind by definition is the problem. That's the problem because the mind is a place of of only illusion, right? Because the mind is symbols, right? Words and pictures are symbols, uh, right? The word chair and the picture of a chair is not a chair. It's a symbol of a chair. So the mind uses symbols to represent reality. So it's not a real place. And then again, the mind can only think in time. It can think about what is going to happen, what did happen, what could happen, what should happen, what should have happened, what could have happened, what might happen, and if. Okay? And none of that is. None of that is real. So that's why I say the mind is just a place of unreality, and it's a very painful place to be. And believe me, no matter how much you like your mind, you don't want to be alone with it. You want to share it somehow. You don't want to be alone with your mind. The minute you're alone, you grab a book or you turn on your computer, you turn on your TV, you turn on your phone, you do something or you sing or you hum or you do do anything not to be alone with your mind, right? So people that are in, uh, in prison would rather be in general population and risk being uh, beaten up and raped rather than be in solitary confinement because you're alone with your mind. So anyway, the mind is just because it's flopping all over the place real quickly, going nowhere. Right. So anyway, just turning it off. So one easy one is you listen to your breathing. Just close your eyes, sit up straight, listen to your breathing. Just listen. With 100% attention, you're going to find your mind flies away. Then as soon as you know it, come back to your breathing. And then your mind's going to fly away and then come back. And if you can eventually get to 15 seconds, that's a long, or you're not thinking, you won't know it until you come out of it. Because while that's happening, while you're not thinking, you're not there to know it. You have to understand that. So, and then a minute, if you get to a minute, you get to two. So again, everybody, five times a day for two minutes, stop thinking, try it. Yes, you can still take the modified citrus pectin after six weeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. And you can take it all the time anyway, because it's going to lower galactin-3. Galactin-3 is also an inflammatory marker. In fact, it's used in cardiology. Cardiologists look at galactin-3, right? Because you all have heard probably of C-reactive protein, CRP. Um, can you take melatonin if you had had a if you had, had a stroke? Absolutely, you can take it, and you should. You need it. It's reparative. It's an antioxidant. And it's an anti-inflammatory melatonin. Powerful, powerful thing. And your body makes it anyway. It's just that we make less and less and less. The more our pineal gland becomes calcified and fluoridated. Um, yeah. All right. And another good thing about melatonin is since it's made, it's it's neural tissue, it's brain, it's nervous tissue. It's not like the other hormones. So, for example. Um, the whole idea of birth control pills is if you're giving a lot of, if you give a birth control pill where you're giving lots of estrogens that are synthetic estrogens, it's you, your your brain, your hypothalamus is saying, oh, wow, we already got estrogen. We don't need to make it. So you don't make it. You don't ovulate. And is, that's how that works. So basically, it will shut down that pathway. Same with testosterone. You're giving a somebody testosterone, like like the, the, the bodybuilders who like to take extra testosterone they're getting shots of testosterone every week and eventually their, their testicles atrophy their testicles shrink because they're not being able, they're not making testosterone anymore so hormones if you take hormones it shuts down your machinery to do it unless you're doing physiological bio, bio uh, biologically identical hormones to replace what you can no longer produce because you've you've already gone through andropause or menopause that's not the same thing at all that i'm talking about what I'm talking about is, uh, uh, you know, t you know, taking it for some therapeutic reason, such as birth control pills or excess testosterone, so that you can uh, uh, 
you know, look like an insect. You know, a lot of people like to look like insects. I'm not sure why. Um, but, you know, big bubbly thing. Um, anyway, so uh, when you do that, you shut off your normal mechanisms. But that doesn't happen with melatonin because it's not, it, it's not like that. It's, neuro, it, it's almost like a, neuro, a, a neurotransmitter. I mean, it isn't, but it's almost like that because it's produced by nervous tissue. It's not the same as the other ones. So no matter how much you take of melatonin, when you go to when you when you get when you when you're in darkness when you get below a certain level of light, then you start producing melatonin because melatonin is on the same pathway uh, biochemically as serotonin, right? Starts out as tryptophan, which is an amino acid, uh, goes to serotonin. When the lights are on, when the lights go off, it goes to melatonin. So you'll make as much as you normally would make at night, even though you take extra. How much should you take? Well, um, I take 100 mil. I take 80 milligrams orally, and then I take four sublinguals. Um, you can take a lot, and you should take a lot, because it's amazing. Just look up. Go to PubMed and look up melatonin uh, and the immune system, melatonin and cancer and all that. You'll be very, very happy you did it anyway guys you know what it's like wow all right anyway i'll see you next week i'll still be here in this uh, country and i'll see you next week so what cop and namaste and aloha to everyone have a good week you guys thank you for joining me appreciate it appreciate it. i love sharing information